Well, I'm John Parker. I'm a community ecologist here at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and I study global change. The biggest components of global change that we have out here in the woods are invasive species. So, for example, this is wineberry, Rubus finicalaceus. It's an invasive rubus. It's a blackberry. It's introduced about 100 years ago as a garden ornamental plant. Birds disperse it into our natural areas and it becomes one of these noxious invaders that you hear so much about in the news. Um, here at CERC, there are about 250 different plant species in the understory. Only about 35 of them are invasive species. But, as you can see, they're about 90% of the cover. So just about everything you see here is an invasive species. And what people are concerned about is why they're so invasive. After all, they don't have what we call home field advantage. They evolve somewhere else. And the leading hypothesis, and one of the things that we're looking at a lot, is the, fact, is the, uh, the sort of the hypothesis that they've escaped their natural enemies. And that's a two-part process. You have to escape your co-evolved natural enemies from your home range, but you also have to avoid new enemies in your introduced range. And of course, one of the biggest enemies that we have here are white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are generalist herbivores. They're mammals. They feed on plants all year long. They eat lots and lots of different kinds of plants. And what you can do is you can actually look at plants and see what they've been eating. So here's a wineberry plant. All of these browse tips of leaves that you see right here are areas where a white-tailed deer has come along and eaten this invasive wineberry plant. So even though this thing has escaped its natural enemies from its home range, it apparently is not doing a very good job of escaping its new novel enemies here in its introduced range. And what we'd like to know is, what impact does white-tailed deer browsing have on the spread of this plant species and others? What the idea is, is that white-tailed deer presumably like to eat native plants and not invasive plants. And so what we can do is we can test the hypothesis then that removing white-tailed deer will influence the abundance of invasive species. And the way we do that is by putting up these large cages to keep white-tailed deer out. So inside this cage we have a, a community that's 10 meters by 10 meters, so 100 square meters, where there are no white-tailed deer. And we have 64 of these spread throughout the forest here at Cirque. So what we have here, this is one of our deer exclusion cages, 10 meters by 10 meters, roughly 7 feet tall. This is to keep white-tailed deer out. Inside the treatment we've got a bunch of plants. Most of those plants are non-native. What we want to do is get rid of them. So we want to hand weed all the exotic plants out. We want to make a world without deer and without exotic plants. So what we have here are a bunch of volunteers. In this case, we have teachers. These are teachers are part of Earthwatch Institute. They're here as volunteers. They're as citizen scientists. And so what they're actually doing is they're hand pulling all of the exotic plants out. Why are they doing this? Well, one of the reasons that they're doing this is we want to make a world without weeds and compare it to a world with, with weeds. So we want to know just what the impact is on natural communities of having these exotic plants around. So what we're trying to find out here, sort of the so what, the who cares, is suppose we find out that it's just a, everything's being driven by deer. Deer eating all the natives, allowing all the invasives to grow up, and it has nothing to do with the invasive plants. But what you want to do then is you want to manage the deer populations in such a way that you increase native plant species diversity and abundance to the level which you want. Alternatively, what if it's just an invasive driven world? Then you don't want to be allocating any of your resources in managing deer. What you really want to do is manage the invasive through efforts like this. Time consuming but potentially effective. Third potential scenario. What if it's the interaction? So what if it is the deer plus the invasives that together are doing everything? In that case, you need to manage both. And that's what this experiment is designed to test. The best estimates are that we spend about $120 billion annually in just the U.S. alone to control and remove invasive plants, the direct and indirect costs. Deer, the same thing. Best estimates for deer, they cost about $750 million in losses annually alone in the U.S. At the end of the day here, what you want to find out, if you manage deer, and if you manage invasive plants, or one or the other, I suppose you don't have to do either one, can you reduce those economic losses?